Hello and uh, welcome to the Texas A&M School of Law's webinar, Farmworker Employment Justice. This is the sixth and final installment of our spring 2021 TAMU Law Answers, Conversations in Law and Social Justice. And uh, this is our webinar series. We're excited to be at, um, at its end. We've had great conversations. Uh, you can find information about our, summit, our webinars at uh, tamulawanswers.info. And so we're excited to introduce today's uh, webinar, which is co-sponsored by the Network for Justice, which is part of the American Bar Foundation's The Future of Latinos in the US and the American Bar Association's Commission on Hispanic Legal Rights and Responsibilities. I'm gonna take the opportunity to uh, briefly um, just highlight some of our panelists for today. Uh, they include uh, Edgar Ivan Igalas Ocho, who is a partner at Martinez y Galas Ocho Law in the Central Valley in California. He's based out of Bakersfield. Brianna Beltran, who's a lecturer at the Farm Worker Legal Assistance Clinic at Cornell Law School. Uh, Professor Beth Lyon, who is also the Associate Dean for Experiential Education and Clinical Program Director at Cornell Law School. And Jose Padilla, the Executive Director of the California Rural Legal Assistance. We have more information about them uh, on the website. We don't go through all the bios because we have a very uh, accomplished individuals and we only have an hour. So I wanna also hand over the presentation to Professor uh, Leticia Saucedo, who's gonna be serving as moderator and she's my uh, partner in crime on this uh, webinar series. She's a professor at UC Davis School of Law. Um, before I hand it over to her though, a couple of things. Uh, while some of the panelists are attorneys and they will be discussing the law, they will be discussing it generally. So nothing in the webinar should be considered as legal advice. If an attendee has an issue that they want to address, they, they, uh, we encourage them to contact their local county bar legal uh, uh, lawyer referral service or, or to contact their own legal advisor to address their unique cir circumstances. Uh, after the initial presentations and discussions, we will have a question and answer session. Please type in any questions you might have in the Zoom Q&A feature. It allows you to, um, uh, to ask questions as we're going on in the presentation, and the panelists will uh, address the submitted questions as time allows. So thank you all for being here, and Professor Salcedo, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Professor Herrera. Um, and I'm really excited um, to have this wonderful group of folks here to talk to us about um, farm worker and access to uh, justice issues. And I wanna start with um, demographics in farm worker communities today. So um, Jose, I'm gonna ask you the first question. Um, can you describe who's working on farms today in California? Unmute, okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, Professor uh, Luz Herrera for, um, for inviting me uh, to be a part of this. Uh, this work is a uh, work that's, um, that's personal to me. Um, and um, and uh, Luz worked, was on our board of directors some time ago. So um, more reason to thank her. Um, but in terms of the demographics in California, I'll say some things. I, I don't, uh, I prefer to talk about the human story, but in terms of, um, of, of, of the data, I'll give you a few pieces. In, in California, um, uh, first of all, California is the largest, uh, I guess the, the largest state in the country with farm worker and, and ag. Um, uh, federal legal aid uh, ha has migrant program. And so we, we are the largest funded. We get about two, $3 million a year to, to serve farm workers through our migrant program in, in, in Sierra Leone. California has 29% of farm workers throughout throughout the country. In California, 90% of those are going to be Mexican born. Uh, and perhaps interestingly or not interestingly, uh, when you look at the United States and you look at the workforce, the farm worker workforce, uh, there's one community that's very, um, has uh, low demographic uh, or, or proportionality in the workforce, and that's the indigenous farm worker. Uh, we've been doing indigenous farm worker work maybe for 15, 20 years, and people are surprised that um, 
I used to think 20% of ag in California was being done by uh, farm workers, but in doing my research this time around, there's about 10% of our ag uh, is done by indigenous farm workers. Uh, in the country, 1% is done by in, in indigenous farm workers. Uh, indigenous farm workers are farm workers who are coming primarily from the state of Oaxaca. They come in not speaking Spanish. They come in, there's, there's three primary groups, um, the Mixteco, the Zapoteco, and then there's the Triqui. Uh, in rural California, we will find the Mixteco and the Triqui. And so we have uh, outreach workers with the capacity to speak indigenous languages. Uh, we have one Triqui speaker. Uh, we have four Mixteco speakers uh, whose responsibility is to do legal education and outreach uh, to that workforce. But again, California has about 10% of that workforce is indigenous. Um, the other thing that's huge in California, uh, as Mr. Aguilas Cocha knows, the farm labor contractor, I guess over the last 15, 20 years, farm labor contracting has come in and um, become a big part of California agriculture. One third of agriculture in California is done from farm labor, uh, done uh, through the farm labor contractor. Um, you know, when I was growing up and um, my dad sent me out to the fields, the very few times we went out, um, you know, we went out with a bunch of local folks who would take us out. My, my, my aunt had a crew, my uncle had a crew. And so they were local folk, but now the grower puts in a middle person. And unfortunately these middle, middle people, people are the ones that take advantage of the farm worker um, um, in, 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 in ugly ways. And I could talk about that later in terms of the issues we see with the farm labor contractor. But anyway, um, like I said, the third of ag in California is done through this middle person. Uh, the other demographic is that about a third of the farm workers are going to be low income. Uh, and, um, and, so, and so that's what we find in, Cal in California. Finally, uh, the other, the other uh, data point is that uh, farm work in, in the country is primarily a, a, a male farm worker. About 68 to 70 percent are going to be male workers um, with about maybe the average age is 38 years and a third are gonna be women, uh, immigrant farm workers. And I will talk about that later as to what kinds of specific issues we find with, the, with uh, that demographic where the uh, women farm workers, the immigrant women farm workers are being taken advantage of by some of their supervisors. So I'm gonna stop there in terms of the demographics in California. Great, thank you. Um, and I wanna make sure that we also cover um, the East Coast. So uh, Brianna, um, what do the demographics look like um, of the farm workers working on farms in the East Coast? Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, in terms of the East Coast, I think there's just, you know, a huge range, you know, as you go sort of North and South, one, one thing that's definitely much more common, well, it's getting more common everywhere, but um, historically has been quite um, true of the Southeast is just the uh, prominence of the H2A program, which I know is gonna come up sort of later in our conversation. So I'll just pin that for now. But um, in terms of New York specifically where we sit, one thing I wanted to just talk about a little bit is just the nature of um, the population given what industries are prominent. And so in New York, there's a huge dairy industry and um, that I think is, you know, it's a year round industry. And I think that tends to just really impact who you see doing that work. So I looked um, the other day at a report that was released a few years ago um, by a group of, of, of both um, nonprofit organizations and academics who collaborated to do interviews of immigrant dairy workers. Um, and they had some demographic um, data. So it was a small sort of group, but they interviewed 88 farm workers. Um, and I think the numbers I'll, I'll uh, cover in a second kind of resonate with, you know, the, the types of clients we represent in the clinic and sort of what we've seen in general. So of those 88 farm workers, 90% were men. Uh, in terms of country of origin, 61% from Mexico, 34% from Guatemala, 93% of them were undocumented. Age-wise, um, you know, it's a relatively young population. 41% were um, age 25 to 34, another 26%, 35 to 44, and then 20% were under 25 years old. And then in terms of family status, 62% were married and 70% had kids. So I threw out some of those numbers just to kind of, it's a small group, but just to kind of give a sense of um, what we see um, 
in terms of the, the nature of the industry impacting sort of who we see in doing that work in terms of people who are kind of settled out and not sort of um, parts of these migratory streams or, or um, here on H2A visas. So that's just a little kind of piece of the, the picture of what we're seeing here in New York. Excellent, thank you. Um, and my sense is uh, both of you have talked a little bit about undocumented um, farm workers as well as seasonal farm workers, even though the, um, the industry uh, might not be uh, seasonal. So I want to uh, move to how these demographics might actually affect the types of cases that you are seeing um, and the, type of, the types of remedies that might be available given the population. Um, with respect to um, ethnicity, age, gender, um, and as Brianna said, H2A status, um, non-immigrant status. So why don't we start with um, ethnicity, um, Jose? In terms of, the, you're talking about in terms of the types of cases we see, right? Yeah, and so you, one of the things that you mentioned was that um, in, you're seeing a lot of indigenous farm workers as well. And right. Imagining that that has an effect on how you approach the cases and what types of remedies might be available. Yeah, well, in, in terms of the the, the, the practice, uh, uh, first of all, let me give a little bit of history to to sort of lay the foundation of why we do the work that we do. Uh, CRLA was was founded uh, by movement movement people, um, uh, movement people that Edgar is uh, very well aware of. Um, uh, coming out of Bakersfield in that part of the country. But the, the uh, CRLA was founded uh, by, uh, on his first board of directors were uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, Dolores Huerta, and those who know, who, who know labor history, the other person who was on that first board was um, Larry Etliong, uh, the Filipino organizer who carried out the first grape strike back in 1965, and we started in 66. And so the founder of CRLA, a guy named Jim Lorenz, came from a corporate law firm in Los Angeles and wanted to do a, set up a corporate law firm for farm workers. Uh, and he, on that first board, he, he had the, the, these movement people on. The other first person on the board of directors, uh, another, another Latino on the first board of directors was uh, the first Latino California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso. And at the time he came on the board, he, he was a private practitioner in Imperial County where I was born and raised. Um, and so, um, but he was on that first board. But ne needless to say, with so many movement people on, labor became a huge focus for CRLA. And so from the very, very start, those farm worker roots impacted the work that we do. Um, for me, the, 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 it was all, as Caesar would say, you know, this is all personal work. For me, it's all, always been personal because uh, uh, my grandparents were farm workers. My father was a migrant farm worker before he went to World War II. Uh, and so we were raised around farm work. Uh, and so it, not surprising that farm, I gravitated to that practice uh, when I got out of law school. But so that was CRLA's founding. Uh, and so labor and employment is huge, huge uh, for what we do. And when you talk about labor and employment, you ask, well, what kinds of cases are you talking about? And I'll just very briefly uh, mention that uh, about our third of our work is going to be in labor and employment. Uh, again, Wage theft, um, the, the, the farm labor contractors uh, being scofflaws, uh, not paying minimum wage, uh, skimming off the top of wage of, of worker wages, uh, all of that leads to, to, to wage theft. Uh, uh, I think the last time I looked at that number and our recovery of wages, I think it was maybe four or five years ago, I mean, we had recovered something like $1.5 million in, in owed wages, stolen wages from, from the worker. Um, and uh, similarly, the, the, um, uh, we do a lot of dairy work case. We have a dairy worker project, too, for the same reasons that were mentioned before. That is, in, in California, huge dairy industry in the Central Valley. But that will attract a lot of the immigrant worker. Why? Because dairy work is, full, full, is year-round uh, compared to farm work, which is seasonal. And so a lot of workers who have been working in, in ag um, will maybe prefer uh, dairy because it means 12, uh, 12 months of work uh, versus maybe the nine or 10 in, 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 in farm work. But so our, pers our practice then has bec become that work. It's uh, um, uh, labor law heavy, uh, less immigration because, the farm because the federal government does not let us represent the undocumented worker. Uh, and, and as I'll talk in a little while, one of the 
uh, areas of practice where we were the first legal aid in the country to practice this type of law was defending farm worker women in sexual har harassment cases. Uh, and I can uh, later on, I'll just touch upon the, the huge, huge settlements that we have won on behalf of farm worker women being um, subject to sexual harassment by the male, male uh, supervisors uh, throughout the industry. Uh, but anyway, those are the kinds of practice that we uh, kind of the, the work that we do. The, again, labor law, civil rights, uh, some immigration um, um, on behalf of farm workers. So I'm going to stop there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, Brianna mentioned that uh, about a fifth of the um, farm worker population, at least on the East Coast, is um, folks who are younger than 25. Um, so Beth, um, how does that affect um, the, the types of cases that you're seeing and the types of remedies that are available? Um, well, thank you very much, Professor Saucedo and Professor Herrera for this amazing series. It's really been incredible what you put together um, and it's an honor to speak with all of you today. Um, so maybe before talking about the remedies, I'm going to focus just a little bit more on some of the demographics around child and youth farm workers. Um, but I, can, I think in the U.S. the story um, is a little bit about the actual numbers, but also about the lack of numbers. And I think it's important to highlight that. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor does a regular survey of farm worker demographics, um, talking with crop workers, um, and states that 3% of farm workers are between the ages of 14 and 17. But because the Department of Labor has an explicit policy of not approaching farm workers during that survey process, if they appear to be under 14 years of age, they don't provide any data on farm workers who are young. And so the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO, recently issued a report sort of cataloging efforts to track child labor in the United States and particularly noted the federal government's worst failure, um, which is tracking child labor in agriculture. So that leaves us with very rough estimates that more than 523,000 children aged under 18 work on U.S. farms and about 148,000 of those are hired as opposed to being um, the children of the farm owner or operator. And of the hired children on farms, roughly 2,700 of them are age 12 and under. Um, and one of the reasons why we see so many child workers is that the U.S. actually excludes agriculture from many of the protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act, including the entry age of child workers. Um, so by mentioning these numbers, um, which are pretty high, um, I do want to note that most farm workers and farm worker advocates that I've worked with are not child labor abolitionists, and neither am I, but I do think it's important to have good numbers as a way to promote safe workspaces for all workers, including young workers. Um, and then just briefly to turn to the types of cases, um, really what we wind up seeing is that because so many workers are, are under the age of 21, it means that if they are in removal proceedings or they're undocumented, they actually have a pathway to citizenship that's a special visa called the Special Immigrant Juvenile Visa. Um, and we've seen how children coming to the US across the border, how they're stopped, they're put in, uh, separated from their families at times, they're put in detention. Um, they sort of run that you know, horrific gamut at the border. But then when they end up working on a farm in the United States, they're still in very active removal proceedings and they're trying to defend those removal proceedings from a very remote location and get to a city that could be three, four, six hours away to attend those removal proceedings and prevent themselves from having a deportation order. So for legal services, that means that we need to reach out, um, find young people who are very uh, nervous about you know, being contacted or being in touch with lawyers and help them to seek this special status through first a family court process and then um, through the deportation process. And I can imagine that that's, um, that's a really difficult process given how remote, as you say, um, these workers um, and these, these children, these child workers um, are. Um, and um, so my question is about um, how clinics are working with uh, legal services organizations to do that kind of work. Apologies, is that one for me? Yeah, that was for you. <laughs> oh, thanks, okay. Um, Brianna. <laughs> uh, well, um, I can just answer quickly and Brianna can fill in, but 
um, because this process is um, sort of a multi-step process, you have to have a predicate order from a state court, whether it's a family court or a um, juvenile justice system. Um, that means that you have to engage local legal services and local family bar, many of whom are not language accessible, are not comfortable with processes that are related to immigration, um, and are worried about sort of the reputation um, with the local judge who oftentimes might even be in agriculture themselves or come from a farm family and often are elected. So that I think is the most difficult piece of it. Um, and then with the immigration portions, oftentimes there are um, privately funded organizations that can assist with those stages, but it all has to be coordinated. And the truth is that probably the vast majority of children never get representation. Um, where we are in Buffalo, which has a huge um, catchment of most of New York State, 50% of, um, of the unaccompanied minor docket has no representation at all, no lawyer in court. Mm -hmm. wow. um, Brianna, I wanna step, I wanna uh, move to you and um, see if you can add uh, to this picture. Um, what's happening with um, H two O work, H two A workers and their representation? Yeah, and I, I mentioned sort of in passing in my first answer, just um, just about the H two A you know work population in the U S. But um, to give a little context and, and just explain, so that the H two A visa is a visa that's available um, to come to the U S. to do temporary agricultural work. Um, it is something that employers apply for. And if a worker gets the visa, um, their time in the US and lawful status is really dependent upon them working for that employer. So they can't leave if things are, are bad and they're supposed to return to um, their home country once the contract term is up. So it's you know, a, a situation that really lends itself to a lot of exploitation, but um, has been enormously popular. So I'm going to try to show um, some slides um, that just give some numbers in terms of what's happened. The um, program has existed for a little over 30 years. So I have some not both in table form and a graph for those who like lines. Um, these are the number of visas that have been granted every year by the State Department. Um, it's a little hard to get kind of precise numbers just because the program kind of operates in two pieces in terms of the Department of Labor certifying positions. And we have information on that based on employer and um, location. So you can get kind of state specific data there. But um, the second step is the State Department granting the visas and that's sort of your, your national um, a picture of how it's grown. So. Um, Here's some numbers you see in 2020, we're at uh, over 213,000. There's just a graph on the same numbers. One thing that um, I found just, you know, recently reading some articles about the H2A program, you know, um, whether <laughs> basically it seems like whether they were written in 2001, 2002, 2010, you know, last year, um, you know, and I've done this, like people comment, oh, it's doubled, it's tripled in the last few years. And no matter where you are in time, people are basically saying the same thing just because it's shot up so much. Um, so I'll, I'll stop that share, um, but I just wanted to throw up for some context. Um, and so I think just one thing that's important is, you know, as I said, this, these are visas that are sort of um, limited in time and, and scope. And so if you're, um, you know, we have some cases, they're not necessarily New York based, but we have cases where we represented H-2A workers or would be H-2A workers in the United States. And, you know, they are time limited. So if you're gonna take on a case that's either gonna be litigation or some sort of um, immigration relief for individuals um, who are in the H-2A status, um, you're probably gonna be dealing with them when they're not in the US anymore. And so there's a whole um, host of logistics and, and concerns that can come up in cases in terms of representing workers who may need to, you know, participate in, in discovery or, um, or, you know, if it's a workers comp case, give testimony, whatever sort of it may be, if they're abroad, sort of the challenges that come with that. Um, and I'll, I'll circle back a little more to give some examples from some of our cases um, in a bit, but, you know, one, I think big pattern we've seen a lot of in the clinic that, you know, cases that I did even before being at Cornell is, um, the common pattern of paying recruitment fees. So these are fees that, you know, workers are charged to um, get the visa or to be put on the list for next year or however you wanna kind of, you know, 
the, whatever the term of art, you know, this situation uses, they're, they're, they're fees that are prohibited under the h 2 regulations, but it's nevertheless super common for workers to be charged these fees um, to be able to participate and get an h 2 visa. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, again, um, I'll turn it back over to, to the next question, but I'll circle back and give some examples of how, um, you know, that, that intersection of sort of workers who've experienced these types of violations and then not being in the U.S., how that presents specific problems. Okay, great. And uh, Jose, did you have something to add? I wanted to, uh, to add something on the H-2A. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in the H-2A program in, in California. Um, and the, 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 the H-2A, legal as they are, authorized as they are, it's still, it's still a captured workforce. And um, uh, right now, um, we're carrying legislation through our foundation. We have a CRLA foundation that does not have the restrictions um, that CRLA, the corporation does. And right now, uh, we're working with Assembly Member Calra uh, um, and Senator Durazo and we've got a, a proposed legislation that will protect H-2A workers, among other workers, against retaliation when they complain and they raise questions about um, in their employment, their housing conditions, their working conditions. And so, to the, again, because they're, they are a captured workforce, you know, they're going to be very fearful uh, because if they complain, um, there are cases of, uh, or they fear being blacklisted in Mexico, uh, where they get recruited, uh, and so we 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 have seen the need to to legislate a little more protection, anti-retaliation protections uh, for H two A workers, um, and that's and that's going through the legislature right now. Uh, I'll stop there. And I can imagine there's also advocacy issues at the federal level. I just rem I remember reading a few years ago about attempts by growers to expand the H2 programs to things like dairies or, um, and at the same time, um, limit access of H2A workers to uh, legal services, um, to health insurance and that sort of thing. Yeah. Right? So there's always a movement, it seems to me, to make them even more captive or captured as you, um, as you say. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to focus on some access to justice issues and bring um, Edgar in um, and um, have Edgar talk to us a little bit about the litigation that's going on now um, at all levels, including the Supreme Court. There's a case in the Supreme Court now that just went to oral argument called Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid, um, which deals with um, growers uh, or growers are actually challenging uh, California state um, uh, law or regulation that allows uh, organizers to go onto properties to um, organize uh, farm workers um, and growers are challenging that as a uh, violation, um, as a taking basically. So Edgar, I know that you and your firm um, are involved in that case. So I'm hoping that you can start us out by talking a little bit about the case and about your involvement. Sure. Thank, and uh, just uh, echoing what the other folks said, thank you, Leticia, and thank you, Luz, for putting this together. Uh, this is a wonderful talk, and I'm glad to be sharing some space with these wonderful folks. Uh, just on, on the issue of, of Cedar Point, so uh, maybe first I'll give a little a little background in terms of the work that, that I do at the firm, that we do as a firm, and then I can go into the Cedar Point work and how that fit, fits in. Um, but, but essentially, our firm is uh, sort of one in a series of, of a historical different, historically different ways that the farm worker movement in California has organized their legal team, right, or or been represented to do the, the all the wonderful things that they've done over the years. There have been times when the UFW in the early days, you know, the attorneys were in house. There have been times when um, it was a private law firm, and it's in all sorts of different variations of. Uh, attorneys coming in to not take the lead in the movement, but sort of support all the different work that's being done, which has always been varied and always been uh, ex extremely crucial, right? So in, in terms of the, the categories of work that we do, it's, it's sort of, I think of it as three bubbles. One is the big bubble of 
uh, general counsel type work where we represent uh, all sorts of different entities within the farm worker movement, which I consider to be, uh, you know, like the United Farm Workers Union, which is a labor organization like the Teamsters or SEIU, right? Uh, there's the UFW Foundation, which is a growing nonprofit organization that does uh, primarily um, uh, immigration legal services throughout California, but has expanded to uh, all sorts of different policy work and is, is starting to expand to different states. Uh, around the country, it's growing very quickly. We represent uh, the only farm worker pension plans and and uh, healthcare plans uh, in the country, as far as we're aware. The Robert F. Kennedy Medical Plan and the Juan de la Cruz Pension Plan, um, and a number of other organizations as well. So anything that they need in terms of contract work, or if they have a dispute, a trademark issue, something like that, we we handle that for them. For the union, the second bubble is essentially labor work, right? It's unfair labor practices, it's representing workers or the union in front of the, um, occasionally the National Labor Relations Board, uh, when it involves workers that are not necessarily considered agricultural. Historically, farm workers have been excluded um, from all of those wonderful things that passed during the New Deal, uh, the National Labor Relations Act, the, the Fair Labor, uh, the FLSA, right? Uh, um, so, so, the history is California passed its own, we consider better version of the law called the Agricultural Labor Relations Act um, that protects uh, farm workers' right to organize in California. So a lot of our litigation has to do with that. And then sort of the third bubble sort of overlaps with Jose's quite a bit. Um, we tend to do some cases together also, which is the wage and hour uh, employment law sort of world. We do, we do a lot of wage and hour class actions. Uh, gender discrimination, sexual harassment cases, all that stuff, right? Um, so where where Cedar Point falls in is, is sort of, uh, it, it goes back to that labor organizing bubble and it's sort of holding the ground for things that were accomplished and battles that should have been won back in the 60s and 70s, right? In 75, uh, California passed the Agricultural Labor Relations Act and it included in part uh, an access regulation uh, that was considered and, and passed that and ultimately held up uh, by the California Supreme Court way back in the day, right? Um, that only affects California. That has to do with an organizer's right before work, after work, and during non-productive lunchtime during the day uh, to on certain, for a certain amount of days per year, go and speak with farm workers, right? So it shouldn't be costing the, the grower any money. It shouldn't be affecting them whatsoever. Um, but, um, you know, the last several years have been a bit topsy-turvy. So for some reason, the, the United States Supreme Court uh, took up an appeal uh, challenging that access regulation that's been on the books for all these decades um, on the basis that uh, the Fifth Amendment takes, takings clause, which um, prohibits uh, public use of, of private land without just compensation. Um, so on the basis that union organizers going on to private property is somehow a taking, right? In the same way that I think they, they mostly couch their argument in, the term, in, in terms of easements, which I'm sure there's um, plenty of law students on, on this webinar who are listening, maybe thinking about easements, things that run with the land and all that sort of stuff, and are probably confused as to why an easements case only affecting California involving organizers would go to the Supreme Court. We're also very confused. Um, uh, so we have no idea how that's going to go, but essentially the, the basis of our, uh, you know, we coordinated with a number of other wonderful organizations that also filed amicus briefs in that case, and with uh, the state attorneys who were, who were presenting the principal case. Um, and essentially that, you know, the, the core of, of everyone's arguments there is, is, you know, the same, the same mechanisms under the constitution that allow union organizers to go onto property to talk to farm workers in California is the same mechanism that, you know, uh, OSHA might use to go and inspect uh, health and safety issues on the farm. Uh, it's the same basis that um, allow the, the government to impose a racial equality standards on private businesses. For example, the takings clause came up in litigation uh, when restaurant owners and hotel owners were forced to open up uh, their, their businesses to, to citizens of, of uh, any race, right? Um, so it's, it's a puzzling case. There's, a, there's, there's a, a Supreme Court case on the books that uh, related to the NLRA that we think um, sort of covers us, but you know, it's, it's a different time. So 
Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I think there's a couple of other things I could also touch on in terms of, of current litigation very quickly. Um, things that have come up. Um, touching on, on the discussion that uh, Brianna and, and Jose were having on H2A issues. Um, this is something I think that's, that's concerned us within the, the United Farm Workers, us as attorneys for the, for the union uh, for quite some time. And there's, a, there's so many issues that come up when you have a captive workforce that's dependent on an employer to recruit them from uh, a community of origin, usually in Mexico, transport them to the United States, to the United States somewhere where they don't know anyone, there is likely somewhere remote, um, and can only work with a particular employer using that particular visa, right? Um, so the concern that we've had for, for a number of years is that this is prime sort of conditions for, for labor trafficking cases, right? Where you're essentially putting someone into a, a modern day version of slavery by forcing them to work against their will, um, using all sorts of different types of coercion. Um, so there, there have been more cases coming out um, on that issue. Uh, there's prominently in the media in certain states, there have been cases that have come up on the criminal side. Uh, we have one case uh, that we argued last summer before the Ninth Circuit involving uh, Mexican veterinarians who were fraudulently recruited uh, using a, a NAFTA TN visa, um, which is supposed to be for, for professionals. Um, and essentially the way that happens is because of things that have already been mentioned, right? Dairy workers are uh, year round. H-2A visas are for seasonal temporary employees. Uh, so some group of, of some groups of, of dairies got together and came up with the idea of using this animal scientist visa to recruit folks to work on their dairies as general laborers without, um, you know, coincidentally, without letting the folks know as they recruited them that that's what they would be doing. Um, so what the case involves with the Ninth Circuit is um, essentially these folks being uh, defrauded into coming into the United States, um, constantly surveilled. Um, and, and threatened with deportation uh, for complaining uh, about their working conditions. So uh, we, we feel strongly uh, that things are going to go our way um, with that case. There's a Seventh cir Circuit uh, case that just came out um, that points in that direction, but we'll see there. Um, and I guess just uh, finishing this off in terms of things that are happening now, you know, it's, it's always sort of a balance between uh, protecting what we have pushing things forward, which we're trying to do with the labor trafficking stuff, and then um, sort of just reacting to things that are happening at the moment. So with, with COVID, um, there have been all sorts of issues that have come up. There have been a number of um, agricultural growers that have had outbreaks. There have been a number of processing plants mm, that we've dealt with um, that have had uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, and, you know, workers will come for us to us for help. Um, and I think not surprising to probably anyone on the call, uh, rather than deal with the COVID issue, employers get into anti-union mode um, and do everything they can to suppress workers coming together to try to protect themselves, right? So those are the, the types of, of issues um, that we've been dealing with. Uh, with that type of litigation, it's a combination of, uh, we worked on some civil litigation, uh, to get uh, restraining orders against employers, force, effectively forcing them to do something about the COVID outbreak, shutting down, cleaning, and implementing new measures and things like that. We've done some litigation like that. We've worked with our sister organizations on, you know, all the contract work that's involved with uh, distributing PPE and, and meals to, to farm workers who need it, um, and and sort of everything in between, dealing with all sorts of agencies. So. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but, uh, you know, it's, it's very important and, uh, it's good to have allies like Jose and Beth and Brianna, um, uh, that are also, you know, doing the work in their own respects. Great. Thank you. And also at the end, we'll ask uh, all of you again, uh, including you, Edgar, how our law students and um, law schools can get involved in that kind of work. But I want to stick with the health and safety issues for, um, for a minute and have all of you um, talk about the types of issues that you're seeing with respect to health and safety, uh, following up with Edgar's um, uh, discussion about uh, COVID related issues and how they're dealing with health and safety. Um, and I wanna start with Beth and one of the questions in the Q&A Beth um, 
is in general, what type of issues are you seeing with respect to health and safety, but also um, the safety protections for young farm workers under OSHA, are they less protective for, than for other young workers? Um, and uh, uh, do you deal with any of these types of cases? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, um, OSHA excludes quite a bit of agricultural work. A lot of workers never um, are not protected by OSHA. Um, and even those that are, um, very few actually see action. Um, the federal government does very little in the way of monitoring safety conditions. So um, many workers over the years have told me I see people coming onto the farm to make sure the food is clean and hygienic and safe and the animals are safe, but no one's coming to check on my conditions. And I really think that's pretty common around the country. Um, so in particular with children, um, the United States is sort of a, a pariah around the world in terms of child labor, because we have a rule that says that although in America, children aged 16 to 18 years old are not permitted to work in hazardous forms of labor, agriculture is excluded. So children working on a farm are permitted to be involved in, in hazardous labor. And for that reason and many other reasons, a child who's working on a farm is five times more likely to experience a fatality, to die on the job than a child working in other, any other industry in this country. Um, so there's some very serious policy issues that need to be addressed, but because of the, the power, the political power of agriculture, we just can't seem to, to get at those things. Um, I did, I just wanna add one thing. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to give a few statistics follow-up um, on Edgar's great presentation about the work they've been doing on COVID with some numbers um, because there has been some research on um, incidents of COVID in farm workers. So there was a study of over a thousand farm workers in central California that found that 20% had antibodies for COVID-19 and in the US population at large, we know it's less than 10%. So that really, I think kind of shows the risks um, and also, of course, we've seen a lot of data on the stark disparities in the rate of COVID cases and COVID-related deaths among people of color in the U.S., and that's also reflected on farms. So 31 states have reported data, and 37% of workers in those industries um, of uh, farm and restaurant work were Hispanic or Latino, but they represented 73% of the laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 cases in those industries. So I just wanted to share that um, the sort of government failure to curb um, opportunism on farms and failure to protect workers is, is really evident in the numbers. Yeah, and thank you for um, sharing those numbers. They're, they're um, pretty um, telling. Uh, Jose, did you, have, did you wanna add something? In, in terms of the COVID work, um, and Edgar mentioned the United Farm Workers. I, I'm on a, on a state advisory group talking about the, the, the you know, vaccination rollout and all that. And uh, Diana Tollefson, um, uh, who is on there from the UFW Foundation, uh, they, she's talked about the kinds of events that have been held in the Central Valley. We're part of those, the UFW is part of those, uh, where, you, where you, you know, you're pushing vaccination for workers, you know, trying to give them access and trying to make sure that they, um, they get their proportional share of, of those vaccinations. But again, it's, it's got, you need advocacy for that, for, that, for that to happen. And so we, again, we, we've partnered, um, that's one of the things we, we put out there that the only way that this was gonna be successful is that for the state, for the state of California to partner with on the ground community-based organizations who have the trust of workers. Uh, and, and so we've, we've been somewhat successful um, in, in those vaccination events, at the same time you use those events to pass out PPE, so that the work because a grower is not going to give uh, masks for, for the most part, and it's got to be uh, uh, other groups working with them. So COVID has has hit that farm worker very heavily. And again, remember about the farm worker: the housing conditions are not helpful. Social distancing on a bus transportation. You think the Department of contractors transporting farm workers on, on their on their on their buses worry about six feet? No, those things those those buses are crowded, and and those, those, that farm worker housing um, uh, crowded. So um, the risk of farm worker populations during COVID has been has has been very um, uh, that health uh, risk has been really fallen heavy on them. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that about COVID. 
Um, uh, is it, can, I, can I make a comment about the health, the safety, health and safety? Yes. I wanted to mention that one of the areas of practice where we do, we look at it as a safety issue and, and Edgar knows about that. And that's sexual harassment uh, advocacy that I, that I touched upon. Uh, and uh, you, you talk about the fact that you talk about a, a captured workforce, uh, farm worker women suffer differently in ag than the regular worker. Uh, the fact that they're immigrant women working in those fields, young teenage a- immigrant women, they get taken advantage of. And so CRLA has done, uh, we're the first legal aid in the country to do sexual harassment work on behalf of farm workers. And we've been doing it now for about 20 years. Um, but that case, the initial case walked in uh, as a $600 wage case, uh, Tanamara and Antel, uh, one of the big grower companies in the Salinas area, um, a, work, a worker there, term, uh, she, she quit her job and was owed two weeks of pay. So she came into the office for two weeks of pay. Uh, at the time, we were starting to work with the federal government, with EEOC, trying to figure out how they might be helpful in doing farm worker, providing farm worker assistance. And um, uh, we were looking for a sexual harassment case because we heard that that was a big issue out there. But it worked, walked in as a $600 case. At the end, it was a $1.8 million settlement on behalf of all the farm worker women who were being sexually harassed working for Tanamura and Antel. Um, if, five years ago, we won another $1.2 million case for women working in the Berries, Ryder Berry Farms case. Um, uh, four years ago, we won a case, $1 million on behalf of celery workers, 19, 22 year old immigrant farm worker women uh, working in the celery, again, being sexually harassed. Uh, by the by, the bosses, um, and so farm worker women, because they suffer differently, our advocacy has to shift. And the idea that you would bring sexual harassment cases uh, against uh, against a grower is is huge, uh, and uh, was a, was a huge thing for us. Uh, and other farm worker legal aids have followed. Florida Rural did a case where they won a seventeen million dollar. A settlement on behalf of farm worker women in 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 Florida being sexually harassed by 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 uh, the uh, supervisors in a the company there. So again, that's one of those areas of practice that's different, uh, but that you know we, I feel great that we have been able to to provide that kind of representation because uh, in a recent conversation with my mother, I was ta- I was bragging about that kind of work, and my mother revealed for the first time that one of my own aunts had been ra- raped in the fields. And, and some, one of my cousins was a result of that. And she, she said, but we, had, we couldn't do anything. That was just the work uh, that was out there. And that was a risk that we faced as, as immigrant farm workers in the Central Valley. And so for me to be able to now provide defense for, those kind of, for that kind of a um, gender issue in farm work uh, has been very uh, satisfying. Uh, so I wanted to mention that that's part of the safety issues that that we address uh, in our legal aid. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about health and safety and H2 workers and see if those the issues are the same or are there other issues that are specific to the population? Yeah, um, just real quick, sort of on the, the health and safety thing. I'm, I'm remembering, um, you know, last summer seeing just lots of sort of articles pop up about different um, H2A like workforces and COVID and you know some, some the reaction of some of the growers was basically to heighten what already was a situation of um, the captive workforce and just like basically not let the workers go anywhere you know <laughs> like and you know they already were you know were in a situation like that and the reaction was not you know more testing or more PPE or actually you know things that could help but just like you can't leave your you know the farm to go anywhere. Um, one thing I wanted to sort of just touch on is, is sort of a couple of case examples from the clinic on um, on H2A issues and sort of the recruitment fees and sort of how it's played out um, in terms of access to justice problems. Um, so, you know, just thinking about the fact that the workers, um, you know, are are from other countries and, you know, if they're here, then go home, how, how that impacts their ability to, to get um, relief. So we, we had a case where, um, we had a group of workers who were recruited to the U.S. Um, uh, on H-2A visas and paid a bunch of recruitment fees in their um, home country before going to the U.S. consulate for their interview. 
And then they ultimately found out at their interview that the visas were canceled, you know, supposedly because the employer had been under investigation. And so, um, you know, that's part of what the, the DOL can do, you know, like if an, if an employer is violating those rules, they will kind of cancel the visas and not, um, not let the uh, employer bring in the workers, but you know, at what cost? The workers are now, you know, they pay these fees and they don't get the visas to come to the US to earn the higher wages, to pay down their debts and, and you know, whatever, um, you know, they were expecting to happen. And, you know, that's just an example of, you know, the workers sort of then, you know, they, they originally tried to pursue an administrative remedy to get DOL to help, but because they never came to the US, they, um, they weren't able to help, you know, organizations like CRLA and the other federally funded organizations wouldn't have been able to represent the workers because they also never came to the US and sort of there's regulations around when you can represent H-2A workers. Um, so, you know, that's just a case that it ended up with us because no one else can really, not really take it. Um, another example is, you know, building on sort of the themes of, of labor trafficking and recruitment fees. We have another group case where we um, have pursued uh, what are called U visas, so visas for victims of um, certain enumerated crimes um, based on a situation of labor trafficking, including recruitment fees, but also other sort of really horrible workplace conditions in the US. And um, you know the the U V the U visa is, is great on the one hand because you can you can apply for that even if you're not in the U S anymore. So the workers went back home, um, and they're able to pursue this form of immigration relief that if approved they could come back to the U S um, down the line. But unfortunately, it's a really oversubscribed program. There's a huge backlog because there's a cap as to how many can be can be granted per year, and so if you know our clients get approved, it may be a dozen years before they come to the US um, versus sort of an equivalent um, US based worker or someone who maybe stayed in the US, you know, after the expiration of their visa, there are different remedies available to them. They, they could have applied for a, a different visa called a T visa based on um, labor trafficking. If they had applied for a U visa, if they were approved, they could be granted um, deferred action and granted a work permit while they wait out sort of this long wait list. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot to critique about even that as well. You know, I'm not saying that's like a great model, but, you know, just thinking about like our clients who sort of um, were experienced these horrible conditions and then sort of did eventually comply with the terms of their visas and went back home. And now sort of they're here waiting a dozen years, hopefully to come back versus, you know, similarly situated workers in the U.S. would have a much sort of faster path to getting um those remedies. So, you know, just seeing sort of the comparative nature of how workers who, you know, were adjacent to were part of the H2A program kind of get, um, you know, doubly harmed, I guess, sort of when trying to pursue their, um, their remedies uh, from other countries. We'll turn it back over to you, Aditya. Good. Um, thank you, Brianna. And it, that's a great, the, both of those are great examples of how uh, complex um, these issues become and um, how important access to justice issues um, are for this particular population. Um, so um, for all of you, this is a question for all of you, um, how can law schools um, help? Um, how do they help uncover the problems that farm workers continue to face and how can they help with the work that's already um, ongoing? Um, Beth, I'll start with you. Great, well, thank you. Um, so I, I think I'll just quickly set up um, so some of the um, dynamics around law schools assisting farm workers. One is that most law schools in America are in cities um, and are focused on moving their students into law firms in cities. And so oftentimes farm workers are sort of an afterthought and not something that a lot of administrations think about. Um, and also the schools that you would think would have the, the best access and the most motivation would be land grant schools, right? They're oftentimes, more in, located in agricultural areas or getting money to think about agricultural issues. But um, what I've found is that oftentimes their audience tends to be big ag and not farm workers. Um, so there's been kind of a, I think obstacles um, for, for a long time. Um, but that said, a lot of law schools, and I'm sure the other speakers are gonna give some great examples have done incredible creative work, whether it's community engagement or teaching or research. Um, and just to mention, in my case, I had the privilege of starting the farm worker clinic at Villanova Law School in 2001. Um, and then the clinic where Brianna and I work here at Cornell in 2015. And I gotta say that 
every semester we have a wait list. Every semester students want to do this work, even if they never thought about it before they came to law school. And so I just really want to commend that it's a great topic um, for law schools to focus on. And I'll also just briefly mention that Brianna and I are, and others at Cornell are, are doing a survey right now about um, sort of university engagement with farm workers. And so if you're at a, a university or if you have a good relationship with the university working on farm worker issues, please take a minute to fill that out. Thanks. And that survey is in uh, the chat. For those of you who are interested, there is a link um, to the survey. Um, anyone else uh, before I move to the last five minutes of uh, Q and A? Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, I think we could do this for another hour, uh, but um, does anyone else wanna add anything before I get to a couple of questions? One of which is Edgar, if you can go in and drop the citations to your labor trafficking cases, uh, in the Q and A, that would be helpful. Um, sure. Jose. Jose, did you have? You yeah, have as, as uh, just just again for for, for, uh, for as, as law schools, I think that to push um, giving public interest lawyering support in whatever way you can. Um, the topics that you teach, I think there's an incredible, to, I saw one comment about how incredible it was that Texas A&M was doing a farm worker um, uh, uh, webinar like this one, but, but, but addressing the issues intentionally, uh, public interest uh, class that talks about racial justice, uh, issues of farm workers can be placed right into a racial justice curriculum. Um, la labor law. I remember I took labor law at Berkeley Law, and there was nothing about farm workers. Maybe that was way back when, but um, the labor law classes, again, having having some focus around that. Civil rights uh, classes, immigration classes, they all can have as a piece farm worker advocacy uh, to discuss the issues that come uh, that came out of of that kind of a practice. The other thing is law student internships or fellowships that are sponsored by the law school. Again, um, it, wherever your law school is, but hooking up with a legal aid that's doing farm, farm worker advocacy, do an internship, maybe some kind of collaboration with, with legal aids uh, like that. They're in Georgia. Those legal aids are in Florida. Those legal aids are in northern New York. I mean, they're there. Uh, and so doing collaborations with some of those legal aids. Uh, I think would be with migrant legal aid, I think would be a very, very good um, sort of form of uh, support for uh, these kinds of issues through your law school work. So uh, I'm going to shut up there. Just a couple quick points uh, before we finish up on this. I, I think I have an, a lot of things to say about what, what law schools can do uh, to, 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 to be able to help um, with, with farm worker issues. I think for myself, what helped was, um, so I went to UC, the UC Irvine School of Law and there were a number of points where I had access to advocates in the, in the farm worker justice world, right? So early, you know, even, even though um, I'm from a farm worker family myself, it, it, it didn't probably occur to me until I got to law school to start looking into this as a possibility uh, because, you know, I saw organizations like CRLA and the UFW as like the big shining star. Um, and it didn't occur to me that actually very few new lawyers that want to do this work um, or have the opportunity to have contact with, with folks doing this work uh, to be able to be introduced to it and see it as a realistic possibility. So what, what definitely worked for me was, uh, you know, having different professors who are in the sort of like, pro bono or volunteer work world, provide opportunities and connections to, folk to folks doing this work. Um, I think our, our firm has a consistent practice of, of having volunteers help us with uh, not necessarily immediate cases, things that need immediate help because that's difficult to do remotely. But you know, for, for the long term, if there's a research project or something like that that we need that'll help us with our advocacy in the future, then we'll have law students help us with that. Um, I think working closely with, with a career development office, making sure it's not just academic, but the career development office at a particular law school is looking at uh, work in rural communities as a realistic option. A, a big part of the, the, the access to justice gap has to do with uh, 
you know, law schools not pushing folks to go to rural places and, and young lawyers not willing to move somewhere, even for a couple of years, right, to do this type of work. So I know for our firm, we've had open attorney position. I have, we've had an open attorney position for well over a year. I know, I know CRLAs that run into the same issue over and over again also. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about sort of making that a realistic option to go be, uh, I think, to, to steal a phrase from Lou, a community lawyer uh, somewhere where, where folks actually need it and tie the curriculum into that work um, will go a long way. But it's, I think it's still a very serious problem. Thank you. And thank you all so much for this wonderful discussion. Um, I definitely uh, learned a lot and I'm sure that um, as well. I'm sorry that we didn't get to the questions and answers. Um, if uh, you all can look at those and see if there's anyone that you can answer um, in, in writing, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna turn it over to Luz Herrera um, and uh, for the conclusion of our webinar. Yeah, and I'll, I don't have a whole lot to say because this is our last webinar in the series, but we're very grateful to all of the panelists uh, for your participation today, but also for your continued good work and to Professor Salcedo for moderating this last panel. Um, again, you can look at these uh, the webinar videos at tamulawanswers.info. There's usually about a two week lag between uh, the last one done and then, and, and then having it loaded. But uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar series and we look forward to um, connecting with you through another means um, through the Network for Justice. So thank you all and have a good evening or afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.